Hello students, Ms. Swanson here, and today we're going to learn about forming compounds. And we're going to specifically focus on ionic compounds, but we'll also talk about covalent compounds at the start. Now I put this picture here just to remind us that when we take different elements and put them together to make a compound, we actually end up with something with very different characteristics than the original elements. So sodium metal is a highly reactive metal. Chlorine gas is toxic, but when we put those two together, we end up with table salt that we eat on a regular basis. So if we tried to eat sodium or chlorine, we would end up sick or maybe worse, but we do need to eat table salt as part of our diet so that we don't end up sick. So we can see that different elements put together give us compounds with very different characteristics from the original elements. So we have quite a few learning goals for today. You should be able to compare and contrast the mechanism of forming ionic and covalent bonds, determine the number of electrons gained or lost for an atom to become an ion, determine the charge on an atom when electrons are gained or lost, and determine how many atoms of each element combine to make an ionic compound. So let's start off with the different types of compounds. We have something called a covalent compound and something called an ionic compound. So if we start off with the covalent compound, the main descriptor of a covalent compound is that electrons are shared. So if we look at the picture there on the left, you can see that each of those different atoms have one electron, and then they come together and they share electrons. So the one on uh, the left almost feels like it has two electrons. The one on the right also kind of feels like it has two electrons because they're sharing each of the electrons that they own. So we call this sharing electrons a covalent bond. Now on the other hand, we have an ionic bond. Oh, sorry. And this happens between two nonmetals. So it's characteristic of nonmetals uh, having a reaction with other nonmetals. Now on the other hand, we have ionic bonds. And this is characterized by the transfer of electrons. So electrons are transferred from one atom to the other they actually form something called ions, which we'll see in a minute. And then those ions are attracted to each other. One has a positive charge, one has a negative charge. Positives and negatives are attracted to each other. And so we end up with an ionic bond. And these happen between metals and nonmetals. And it is the metal that ends up losing the electron to the nonmetal, which ends up gaining an electron in an ionic bond. So let's take a look at our ions a little bit more closely. An ion is an atom that has gained or lost electrons to obtain a full valence shell. Now it may gain one or lose one electron or it may gain or lose multiple electrons. It depends on the actual ion that you're talking about. So let's take a look at fluorine. Fluorine has seven electrons in its valence shell. Remember that valence shell means the very outside shell. So it has seven electrons in its outside shell. It could either gain one electron to get eight, which would give it a full valence shell, or it could lose seven electrons and then make the shell below its valence shell and it would have a full valence shell. Well, it's much easier to gain one electron than it is to lose seven. So fluorine is going to end up gaining one electron and we actually call it an anion. So ions that have gained electrons are referred to as anions. Now let's take a look at sodium. Sodium has one electron in its valence shell. It can either lose that electron and have a full valence shell in the shell below, or it could gain seven electrons. If it gains seven electrons, then it would have a full valence shell in its current valence shell. Now it's much easier to lose one than it is to gain seven. So sodium will lose that one electron and we call these cations. So atoms that have lost electrons to become ions are called cations. So how many electrons are gained or lost? Well, we can actually find a uh, pattern in the periodic table. Everything in the first column at the far left will lose one electron. In the next column over, it will lose two electrons. The next column over with boron and down will lose three electrons. Then if we move over to carbon, it will either lose four or gain four because it is just as easy or just as hard to lose or gain four electrons. If 
we move over to the nitrogen family, it will gain three electrons. Then if we move over to oxygen, it will gain two. To fluorine, it will gain one. And if we move over to the very last column, our noble gases, they don't tend to form ions, so they neither gain nor lose electrons. So for magnesium, because it's in the second column, that second column tends to lose two electrons, so magnesium will lose two electrons when it becomes an ion. Chlorine is in the second from the right column. Those tend to gain one electron, so chlorine will gain one electron to become an anion. Now what about the charge that each of those ions becomes? Well, if you're losing electrons, electrons have negative charges. So if you're losing something that's negative, you become more positive. And on the other hand, if you gain something that's positive, or sorry, if you gain something that's negative, then you're gaining more negative stuff, so you'll become negative. So atoms that lose electrons become positive and atoms that gain electrons become negative. So we can see the charges that they'll obtain depend on how many electrons they've gained or lost. So again, there's a pattern in the periodic table. Everything on the far right column from hydrogen down will become a plus one charge. The next column over, plus two charge. The next one, plus three charge. Then we get to carbon. It will either be plus four or minus four, depending on whether it's gained or lost those four electrons. And then if we continue along our, our path, negative three, negative two, negative one, and then zero for our noble gases, which don't tend to gain or lose electrons. So magnesium, we said, would lose two electrons. And because it's in the second column, that means it will have a plus two charge. Chlorine, we said, would gain one electron. And because it's in the second column from the right, that means it will have a negative one charge. So now we'll take a look at some diagrams, which actually show us how these different ions interact with each other. So first I'll show you a little animation, and then I'll show you how we draw this. So sodium has one valence electron, it's going to lose that electron, and chlorine needs one valence electron, so it will gain the electron from sodium. And that means sodium becomes positively charged and chlorine becomes negatively charged. So we would draw that like this. Sodium with its one valence electron, chlorine with its seven, like that. And we draw an arrow from the sodiums, from sodium's electron over to chlorine to show the transfer of electrons. And if we notice here, sodium which has a one plus charge and chlorine which has a one negative charge, if we add those two together, we end up with zero. And this is characteristic of ionic compounds that their overall charge is zero. Let's take a look at another example. Magnesium has two electrons to get rid of, and sulfur has two that it wants to gain. So those two electrons will transfer from magnesium to sulfur, and magnesium will now have a two plus charge, and sulfur a two negative charge. And so we can draw that like this. Magnesium with its two valence electrons. Sulfur here, which has six valence electrons and we'll draw the transfer of electrons from magnesium to sulfur using arrows. And this time magnesium has a two plus charge, sulfur two negative charge. If we add those two together, we still end up with zero, so we know we have the right number of each. Now let's look at magnesium and chlorine. Magnesium wants to get rid of two electrons, but chlorine can only take one. So if one electron gets transferred from magnesium over to chlorine, we end up with a sta an unstable magnesium ion that has only one electron in its valence shell. It's going to search out another chlorine and it will transfer its electron over to that other chlorine to get its two plus charge. So now both chlorines are happy stable ions and the magnesium is a happy stable ion. And so we can draw that like this. Magnesium with its two electrons chlorine which has its seven and the other chlorine which also has seven and we'll show the electrons transferring from the magnesium to one chlorine 
and to the other chlorine. Now this time, we have a two plus charge for the magnesium, and we have two one negative charges for the chlorine. And if we do all that math, we still end up with a charge of zero overall on the compound. So because of that, um, we have something called the zero sum rule. Now the zero sum rule, we're not going to go into detail in this video, but if you're interested in class, I can show you how to do the zero sum rule, and it will tell you how many of each of the different atoms you need to combine together to get an ionic compound. Now we're going to do something that's a little bit faster than the zero sum rule right now, and this is called crossing over. Now it does have a couple exceptions, so you need to listen carefully to find those exceptions when the crossing over rule won't work exactly as normal. But the way that it works is that you look at the charge on each of the different ions, and you take that charge and you cross it over to turn it into the subscript for the other element. So if we look at aluminum, it has a 3 plus charge, so we're going to put a subscript 3 for the sulfur. The sulfur has a 2 negative charge, so we're going to put a subscript 2 for the aluminum. So those charge cross over to turn into subscripts for the other element. Let's take a look at another example, lithium and oxygen. Lithium has a 1 plus charge. We cross that 1 over to the oxygen. Now remember, we don't write subscript 1s, so we just leave that subscript blank. The oxygen has a 2 negative charge, so we'll cross that over to the lithium, and we have 2 lithiums. Now here's when we end up with an exception to the rule. Magnesium has a 2 plus charge, and sulfur has a 2 negative charge. Now both of these can be divided by 2. So we look for the biggest number that can divide into both of the charges, and we divide by that number before crossing over. So both plus 2 and negative 2 are divisible by 2, and each time it will give us the answer 1. So we cross over our 1s instead of the 2s, and since we don't write subscript 1s, we just end up with MGS, 1 of magnesium and 1 of sulfur. So when we do our crossing over, we're actually crossing over the divided number rather than the whole number. Now let's just say for a minute that magnesium had a 4 plus charge. We know it doesn't, but let's just say it has a 4 plus charge. Both 4 and the 2 on the sulfur are divisible by 2. So we would divide the 4 by 2 to get 2. So we'd have 2 with magnesium that would cross over to a subscript 2 for sulfur and one with the sulfur that would cross over to give a subscript one for magnesium, and we would have ended up with MgS2. So we always look for the biggest number that will divide into both of those. So we call that the greatest common factor, if you remember that from math class. So we look for the greatest common factor and divide both charges by that greatest common factor before crossing over. So always be careful if you see the two charges are either the same or they're multiplied by the same number, you need to do that extra step before crossing over. So let's take another look at all our learning goals here. You should be able to compare and contrast the mechanisms for forming ionic and covalent bonds. You should be able to determine the number of electrons gained or lost from an atom to become an ion. You should be able to determine the charge on an atom when electrons are gained or lost. And you should be able to determine how many atoms of each element combine to make an ionic compound. If you can do all these things, fantastic. If not, please rewatch the video. And if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. All right, that's all for now. Bye bye.